Thanks, Harry. Um, so uh, I am probably Partha's most applied student. Um, so you're going to see a sort of very conspicuous lack, lack of mathematics in this talk compared to everything else. But I have lots of uh, pretty pictures that I hope will keep your attention to some extent. Um, so I, so um, So uh, I worked in uh, uh, speech recognition with Partha. Um, he had a couple speech students, but I think I was by far the one that did most in speech uh, with him. Um, but I also you know, managed to, to do a fair amount of work you know, looking at things like manifold learning in conjunction uh, with speech. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of this. But uh, realizing that I'm in a room full of non-speech recognition people, which of late has been a little um, unusual for me. I'm very used to being around a lot of speech people. Um, I thought I'd just give you very briefly the very high-level schematic of how a speech recognizer works. So the idea is you have some speech signal coming in, comes into your sound card, um, and some analog di uh, digital converter will produce a discrete time series. And from that, you'll have this sort of acoustic front end. So it's the first component of a speech recognizer, which is going to take consecutive frames of that speech signal moved up, say, every 10 milliseconds and produce a vector time series of observations um, in some Euclidean space, uh, and, and here I say it's of d dimensions rd. Now, given that representation, you're now going to send it off to the decoder. And so the decoder has sort of three sources of information that it uses to ultimately try to produce the underlying message as a sort of text sequence uh, and time, in this case, word one, word two, word three, and so forth. And those three components are the acoustic model, pronunciation lexicon, and a language model. And so the acoustic model is responsible for taking this vector time series and interpreting it in some sort of categorical way. The most common ways in terms of uh, uh, phonemes. And so phonemes are sort of the smallest units of uh, uh, um, sound in, in speech. So ah, sa, sh, and so forth are all phonemes. And the acoustic model is charged with taking these real valued observation vectors and mapping them to a likely distribution across the phone set. The pronunciation lexicon defines how all the words in a language are pronounced. So it's essentially a dictionary where each for, word, for each word, you have a sort of canonical surface form pronunciation of the word. And finally, the language model is used to impose some sort of higher level uh, grammatical constraints on, on, on the decoding. So it's going to take into account that um, you know, given the last few words that we saw in the speech or predicted in the speech, what's the likelihood that we'd be seeing this next uh, word? And it uses that to constrain what is otherwise a very noisy process up until this point. So Partha um, was primarily interested uh, in these two boxes, the acoustic front end, because he ultimately was an electrical engineer by training, um, as well as the acoustic model, because you can imagine you're going this from this vector time series to something categorical. And that sounds a whole lot like machine learning. And, and you know, Partha obviously is interested in machine learning. So I'm going to focus mostly on acoustic model. Um, because this is what I worked with Partha on. Um, and uh, to give you just a quick sort of whirlwind, uh, Misha asked me to uh, sort of put Car Partha's work in speech recognition in some context. Um, and so I'm going to spend the sort of first half of the talk sort of uh, giving you a little background of acoustic modeling, identifying where Partha fits in, and then go into some of the, the work we did um, in detail. And one project in particular I'm going to take a bit on a, a deep, deep dive on. Um, and so acoustic modeling started off a long time ago with a bunch of uh, engineers, electrical engineers and uh, speech scientists, typically linguists, um, uh, trying to make sense of this very complex signal uh, known as speech. Um, and so before the mid-'70s, it was sort of very rule-based um, and uh, very uh, based on sort of knowledge of speech as this sort of uh, linguistic um, object. And uh, the sort of extent of the uh, computational side of all of it was limited to sort of basic pattern recognition. Okay? So the idea is you have some input signal. You compute some uh, spectral representation of the input signal. So this is a spectrogram. At each point in time, you get sort of the spectrum across all of the frequencies that a sound can be um, produced at. And the idea then is that you're going to go off um, to some collection of examples. In this case, you have a bunch of examples of phonemes. And you're going to try to figure out what the most likely sequence of phonemes was 
or words, it could also be words, of this input signal based on their relation, just as a pure pattern matching relation to the underlying or to this repository of examples you have of all of your speech units. And so the sort of canonical algorithm at the time is this thing called dynamic time warping, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. There's a simple dynamic program to figure out similarity between variable size chunks of a vector time series. Okay, and so in this example, and I apologize, I did have audio for this, but somehow the conversion from Windows to Mac killed it. Um, but you can go from something, your input signal here, your best selected templates, obviously just as images look very different, but after the warping you get something which sounds very similar, except it would be a completely different voice. So this is a sort of fairly uh, powerful algorithm um, at the same time. You can imagine, especially back um, in the mid-70s, to actually do something like this with the computers they had at the time. You weren't going to really scale up to a large useful system. You're not going to get anywhere close to a large vocabulary recognizer with it. And so on account of that, um, starting around the mid-70s, but it didn't really sort of pick up all of its steam until um, much later in the 80s and the 90s, uh, you had a bunch of really smart, uh, predominantly electrical engineers, although I think he was a computer scientist, um, who uh, sort of faced with the really poor com computation they had at the time, uh, came up with a very sort of cleanly formulated, and I think this was the appeal uh, model, uh, to how to take this input vector time series and produce some sort of categorical sequence or at least a sort of distribution as a function of time across these categorical units. By the way, this is Fred Jelinek, Larry Rabiner, and Jim Baker. Um, and uh, that is the hidden Markov model. And so I'm assuming everybody more or less is familiar with a hidden Markov model, but the sort of key insight for its application to speech is that you have your vector time series observations, you have some set of hidden, uh, hidden uh, states, um, and those hidden states in the context of speech are going to be phonetic units. So at each point in time you have an observation and then you're going to ask uh, what's the most likely hidden state, hidden unit, that is what is the most likely phoning. So uh, comes the 90s. All of a sudden we start getting lots of computers. I work in a center now where we have um, a thousand cores at your fingertips. You can sort of do massive amounts of computation that was one wasn't even a dream probably in the, the 70s and 80s. Um, and you also have massive access to data beyond your wildest dreams. And so as I hear a lot in this conference talking about manifold learning and leveraging unlabeled data for um, uh, uh, unsupervised learning and semi-supervised learning. As you, Partha used to talk a lot about you going off to infinity where you is the number of unlabeled examples that you have. And at least in the speech field, we have that. Now, you can go off to infinity. There's companies like Microsoft and IBM and Google um, that are sitting on vast repositories of speech data. None of it's transcribed, but it's there. And it's there sitting on disk because disk has also, um, disk capacity has gotten really cheap to have a whole lot of it. So something to keep in mind to you guys, the scale is important. Um, but in the 90s, they figured out how to dump such complexity into this core HMM-based acoustic model um, where you're talking about having, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of Gaussians used to model the acoustic space. Hundreds of thousands of Gaussians with a vector time series representation sampled every 10 milliseconds is itself pr enough parameters to memorize a whole hour of speech. And that's just in the model, right? And so you're sort of imagining that as computers are fast enough, get faster and faster, you can essentially memorize all the speech that you ever had, and you're all of a sudden back in that original dynamic time warping scenario where you can just sort of have access to the whole world's uh, worth of uh, speech audio to do your best template matching, and you make all of that really fast, and that's essentially where this is going. But they're still running this in this HMM framework. You're also processing hundreds of thousands of words, so very, very large vocabulary recognizers. You're modeling these phonetic states as in the context of two phones in each direction around it. And so these phonetic states are context dependent now down to the point of actually modeling a phone in the context of what is oftentimes a particular word. Um, and you have all sorts of speaker and noise model adaptations, discriminative training, and your sort of standard state of the art recognizers now are being trained on thousands of hours of speech. Okay, so it's a very different picture than what it was when this whole HM, HMM paradigm was, was invented. Now, uh, it is the case though, um, and this is the sort of most important thing, that despite all of this, all of this advancement, 
Um, it's still at the heart of it is this very simple machine um, that's simply plotting along frame by frame and deciding what the distribution over all, their, all of the uh, phonetic states are. So at the core, nothing has changed algorithmically. Okay, so this whole time, during this whole time that all of this has happened, you had sort of one holdout group at MIT of, uh, this is Ken Stevens, uh, Victor Zhu, Jim Glass came later, um, that are sort of still interested in trying to understand speech as an object and um, bring to bear that understanding on um, uh, useful technologies. And I think my understanding of it, as has been told to me by people who have been around a lot longer than I am, um, is that MIT is pretty much the only place that could afford to continue doing it this whole time. That as these sort of, you know, simple HMM algorithms sort of became uh, very useful and industry picked them up and they sort of dominated the field. Everybody was forced to follow along. Um, MIT being MIT was able to do what they wanted. Um, now, Partha obviously was a student at MIT uh, in the 90s and these three guys were there advocating of lots of things like uh, distinctive feature, um, phonological systems, acoustic landmarks, and I'm going to get into later on what these things uh, mean. Um, but needless to say, he was very, very influenced by these people there um, at the time. Now, uh, so, so then the, the question is then, how does sort of Partha fit into this picture, and how does this picture fit into Partha's interests as a as a researcher? And you know, I think most people, most of you, think of him as a machine learning researcher. And uh, that's not at all con inconsistent with his interest in speech. So Partha fully bought into this knowledge-based stuff. He was very interested in linguistics, or more generally phonology. Um, but he obviously was interested in statistical learning. And he sort of had two questions that I think he was primarily interested, if I can sort of boil it down to two sentences. And one is, can sort of all of these interesting theories of um, linguistic structure at the phone and word level and so forth um, be built into some kind of sort of cleanly defined statistical learning framework, something like the HMM. Partha always thought the HMM was beautiful in its simplicity. And he wanted something that was that beautiful, but was somehow taking advantage of all of this, this linguistic, linguistic knowledge that you know, all of these, these greats at MIT um, were talking about for so long. Um, the other question he had is, could all of his powerful statistical learning frameworks that he was working to develop be applied to speech audio and uncover this linguistic structure automatically. So these are, I think, the two sides of, of the coin for Partha. So to give you, uh, very briefly, um, Partha was very interested in distinctive features, and this is a theory going back to, and the linguist in the room can correct me, but going back to uh, um, Morris Halley, and who's the other author? Yeah, I think it's Trubitz, Frank, Okay, yeah, okay, so it goes away, okay. So, yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, and so, uh, sort of theory of distinctive features is essentially that every phoneme in, in your inventory can be explained in terms of this sort of, and so this number changes depending on the theory, but I, this is the one that sort of got imprinted on me, this sort of 26-dimensional bit vector. Now, the idea is each one of these phonemes, you're not getting there via random projections like some of the talks um, have been here but that you're getting there with nonlinear mappings. That is, these distinctive features um, are encoding some very complex structure in, in, in the acoustic space. Um, so what are these distinctive features? These are sort of binary uh, sort of categories, like is the speech sound voiced? Is the speech sound a consonant? Was it produced with uh, a closure of the lips or are the lips involved? Um, is it a sound that you continue? Um, or, or is it something that has some kind of abrupt temporal structure? And Partha sort of saw this as very intriguing, I think, because he saw it as a way, this sort of underlying structure to the set of speech sounds, as a way to sort of deal with um, the problem of data inf insufficiency in high dimensional spaces. Um, in particular, he thought that um, you know, while phone sets are going to vary greatly across languages, somehow there was something very fundamental about these distinctive features, that this underlying structure was sort of language universal to some extent. Um, and that he thought that since that structure is there, you can use your data in more clever ways and that you can, uh, if you weren't trying to define a P-way uh, multi-class classifier for the phonemes, right? But instead we're trying to make a bunch of very simple, uh, more obvious binary distinctions between was this sound voiced or not, that that would be a much better way to use your data. That is, you'd have more data to make every 
distinction. Okay. So uh, Partha, as as Parvati was talking about earlier, went to Bell Labs um, after um, after his uh, uh, PhD and postdoc at MIT, um, and he joined the speech group there. And I think he, you know, Bell Labs has this really amazing history of speech recognition research. A lot of the greats were there, and sort of earlier on, a lot of the great sort of speech scientists were also there. And so I think that's what it was uh, appealing to him. And he went there essentially with this idea that, look, we're going to take all of our knowledge of statistical learning and we're going to merge it with this theory of distinctive features in the sort of Ken Stevens uh, style. And we're going to get a brand new recognition architecture. And they looked, well, I should say lots of people there looked at him like he was crazy and told him to get out of there. Um, and uh, so needless to say, there was substantial uh, opposition. But sort of into a little more detail, um, what he was proposing was something like this, that you're going to go off into your speech and instead of extracting some very uh, universal uh, features like you know, spectrograms or something derived from spectrograms, you're going to design specific sets of features for each one of the distinctions you wanted to make. So if you're, going, if you're looking to, to detect whether a given uh, frame of speech was voiced or not, you're not going to get that from a spectrogram. You're going to build something to detect voicing. You're going to measure something like periodicity or total energy in the signal, something like that. Second, uh, for each one of these distinctive uh, feature categories, and he starts with the uh, manner classes. So manner classes are broad classes of uh, speech sounds. He wants to build um, uh, support vector machine classifiers to make these distinctions, and then use those to identify points in time that that feature was either turning on or turning off or reaching its sort of most realized uh, form. And so this sort of is related to a theory of Ken Stevens again, which is that you can go off into a speech signal, find the points of time where something perceptually or um, uh, sort of salient is happening or something where um, some particular event in the production mechanism was uh, uh, occurring. Go off and find those uh, points in time and those are going to be your landmarks for the speech, uh, for what was said, or alternatively you can think of them as acoustic events. And then uh, finally, given all of those landmarks you detect, you can go sort of around each landmark and do some further machine learning classifications to narrow down place of articulation and things like that. So this is what he sort of uh, proposed uh, at the time. OK, so you fast forward maybe eight years or so. Um, and at Johns Hopkins, where there's a um, fairly high profile yearly summer workshop on language and speech processing, this is about half of the workshop. Um, and so you notice that the people involved, none of them look like Partha. Partha actually felt he was too busy uh, <laughs> to participate in this workshop. Um, but, but Carol S.B. Wilson, who actually wasn't there, but she had a student there, um, these two, and Mark Hasegawa Johnson from he's at UAUC uh, now, were both students of Ken Stevens, so obviously believed in this. But I think they started working um, in much the paradigm Partha suggested bringing machine learning uh, into the mix. Um, and again, you have Jim Baker, um, whose thesis defined the HMM for speech recognition, who is now working on landmarks. And actually, Karen was also there. And Karen's going to talk later in the day about her use of articulatory features, which are related to distinctive features, um, which has been a sort of big push in her work as well. So. Uh, also, by 2004, um, you have some of Partha's former skeptical Bell, Lab, Bell Labs colleagues. This is Chin Lee, Larry Rabiner, um, who began pursuing something that was very, very similar. I think I'll leave it there um, to what Partha was proposing back in the Bell Labs days and their automatic speech attri attribute transcription uh, project, which is essentially going off into the speech and trying to uh, detect distinctive features and when they occur and when they turn on and off, and then make uh, predictions about what words were being said based on, on that uh, as well. And so I, I think uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and I think uh, that's what's going on here. So uh, this is where I show up. Um, this is from my master's paper in 2005. Um, and the first thing I worked on with Partha was applying manifold learning techniques to speech. And so Sanjoy uh, talked about yesterday um, uh, Partha going around and giving the same talk a half a dozen times with, you know, there's this manifold structure to speech. Well, I was the student that worked on that. Um, and so I came from physics originally. And so what Partha saw that as an opportunity that he can get me to 
solve some wave equations and produce simulated uh, manifolds for speech sounds and then apply uh, to that simulated data the manifold learning algorithms directly and see if you can recover uh, nice, clean, flat uh, spaces, parameter spaces. And so this is a, a picture that actually, these are from the master's paper, but this is a paper that has yet to be published. Um, but the idea here is that we have a, uh, this is the manifold produced by um, solving the wave equation and varying two parameters. So it's a two-dimensional parameter space. We're going to vary the total length of the vocal tract and the cross-sectional area between the first half of the vocal tract and the second half of the vocal tract. So you imagine that you're varying the total length. That's like varying speaker, right? People of different sizes have different length vocal tracts. As you vary the cross-sectional area between these two tubes, that varies the phoneme being produced, in this case, vowel. It's the vowel being produced. And so you have this very obvious two-dimensional parameter space. It maps to this very complicated nonlinear space and nonlinear manifold in high dimensions. This is a principal component projection of, of the manifold in 50 dimensions. Um, and you apply Laplacian eigenmaps, and, and you're able to unroll this just like the Swiss roll. But unlike the Swiss roll, there's some, some science behind where this comes from. So the hope is, uh, with something like this, is that you see that you end up unrolling this 2D parameter space, and you have this nice, clear, independent direction for what speech sound is being produced and what person was producing it. And so by applying these sort of nonlinear projections to your, your data and unrolling this complicated structure, you now have a sort of new space in which you can factor things out like speaker variation, phonetic variation, and this is sort of the holy grail of speech recognition. So um, this led to our first paper together in 06, um, uh, and this is essentially going off now, um, coming up with an out-of-sample extension to apply its Vicas's uh, uh, manifold regularization, but with no supervision, so it's fully unsupervised. You have just the um, extrinsic uh, regularizer and the intrinsic regularizer, no labeled data. And you use that to come up with a set of nonlinear projection maps that take your original spectrogram representation of speech and map it to what we call the intrinsic spectrogram using intrinsic Fourier analysis, and you end up getting this. And so you can take this representation of speech and so that the phonetic categories are more linearly, easily linearly separable in this representation than in the original separation. And that's consistent with this notion that you're unrolling this complicated structure into this nice, simple uh, parameter space. So the last sort of main thing that Parthi and I worked on, and I spent most of my PhD on this, was sort of starting with these notions of acoustic landmarks, finding points in the speech signal which are sort of particularly relevant, and going and trying to do standard speech recognition tasks with that. Um, and so the question behind all of this, and this is the title of the talk now, um, is are this, is this sort of frame-based processing of speech and frame-based statistical modeling of speech the optimal way to go about it? That's sort of the assumption behind the HMM is that, look, we came up with this very simple machine that can decode speech, and that's obviously the right way to do it because we're able to get 20% uh, word error rate or something like that. And, um, and the question behind this work, which I think is sort of always there in part this thinking about the subject, was you shouldn't assume that this is right just because everybody's doing it, but that you should actually you know, test whether or not there might be a better way to do it. And so in particular, we're interested in finding out is, is there a sparser level of detail that you can get away with? That is, do you need to actually be processing the speech at every point in time and characterizing it according to some phonetic system at every time point? Or is it sufficient to just make it, you know, make uh, a sort of characterization, characterization of the speech every once in a while? Um, at the places that seem most important, and then build your statistical model there and decode the speech in terms of that. Okay, and so that's sort of what we're interested in. So this particular example, um, I don't think I was ever able to show Partha, which is too bad because I'm convinced myself that this is the counterexample to the HMM. So what you're looking at is proof that the HMM is, is grossly incorrect as a model for recognizing speech. If the human's capacity to do it is somehow uh, something that we would like to emulate with a machine. Um, and so what's going on here is we have a recording. It's going to be a single word. Um, it's me saying the word. Um, and what I do uh, for that recording is I apply a standard phonetic acoustic model. 
And at every point in time that that phonetic acoustic model is very confused about what the given speech sound is, that is the distribution across the phone set has high entropy, um, I'm going to mask that bit of the speech signal. I'm just going to completely clobber it. Right? And so what you see in the speech signal is that there's regions of black. Those are the regions that remain. Everything in gray has been set identically to zero. Okay? And, uh, and so you get this sort of very sort of choppy bit of speech. So I'm going to play you what's left. And it doesn't work. So I had sound before. No? All right, I'll try to uh, play it from my speakers. So unfortunately, it's very, very quiet. What is it? You heard it all the way down there. All right, good. Oh, oh that's a good idea. But then I'm never going to get it back on again. Right? Does anybody know where the speakers actually are in this thing? <laughs> because you don't see any holes or, I don't know. Uh, Okay. Anyways, enough people in the room got it where I think you've convinced everybody else who didn't that it's possible. So the, the idea here is that the idea here is that even though I've clobbered in this way 60% of the speech signal, right, you can still understand it. Okay? And what I can say with extreme confidence is that implies necessarily that there exists sufficient information in this representation for you to recognize the word. Because you just did it, OK? And so this is the spectrogram that you get from this severely clobbered speech signal down here, OK? Um, and what these blue bars correspond to is nothing. That is, there was zero signal present in, in those points in time, unless there's no spectral information whatsoever. Now, the next question is, is what does the HMM do to model the word recognition? Well, what they do is they take a bunch of phonetic states, one for R, one for E, K, and so forth, and they put them in this left to right topology. And then for that word to be decoded, right, for this vector time series that comes in, it needs to be OK with being in the rest state for a while, the S state for a while, and so forth. And so what you're going to find with this is that as these all zero frames come in, which the recognizer is going to be 100% convinced are silence because it has nothing to do with any of those sounds, it's going to have to get an extremely low score for all of these frames when it's wanting to be in that rest state the S state, and so forth. Right? And so what you're going to find is the recognizer is not going to recognize this word as recognition, okay? unless you inserted a silent state between every other phoneme state, and then that's going to give you a bunch of insertions and so forth. And so what I'm going to claim is that the speech recognizer, uh, as currently defined with HMM, processing every frame um, is incapable ever of matching human performance and recognition. And this is just a single counterexample. You can dream up a million more in all sorts of other ways for why the HMM is clearly the wrong idea. This is something that Partha believed, I think, to his core. And this is why he got himself in trouble like he did at Bell Labs. And I think, um, ultimately, it's why uh, recognizers um, haven't really caught on in their current form. Nobody uses them, not for full-blown word recognition. So uh, what might be a better, better way to go about it? So we were talking before about landmarks, um, and uh, sort of there's a kind of, you know, Ken Stevens again and then his students, um, sort of there's an acoustic phonetics motiv motivation for going to something sparser. And so the idea here is, again, speech is produced as I'm moving all of these muscles in my mouth and my vocal tract. Um, and all of these things are sort of moving independently. And as these things move, they generate at very particular points in time the speech signal some acoustic signature of what was actually happening in my mouth at that given point in time. And these things can be transient, and they can be very sort of local in time, and that the timing that they actually occur, can occur and can be meaningful. Um, so the sort of canonical example of this that I think Morgan's very familiar with is voice onset time. And that is the time between your, uh, uh, the burst when you're producing a stop consonant and the time that the voicing actually occurs helps you distinguish uh, the stop consonant um, being produced. So that somehow these two particular landmarks in time and the time between them are helping you identify what's being said. Okay? Um, it's also true that all of these articulators are moving independently and that these things are not 
sort of asynchronous in time and that these events aren't being processed at all on this sort of very steady, even clock. Um, so that's sort of piece of motivation number one. The second comes not on the production side, but on the perception side. So there is this whole sort of collection of neuroscience research that I think uh, Partha Mitra um, was very interested in, and I think they thought very similarly on this. Um, in this sort of uh, example, um, they take a, uh, in this case it's a bat, but you can do this in all sorts of animals that have um, uh, audio communication um, systems, um, and you can play various uh, sounds in the bat sort of communication system to it and measure the response of individual neurons and how they re you know, react. Um, and in this case, you're playing this sort of noisy bit followed by a burst. So, or actually, sorry, no, this is a um, periodic bit followed by a burst. So you can think of it like a vowel followed by a stop consonant, okay? And when you play this, there will be a neuron in the bat's brain that's going to respond violently when it sees that particular pattern. However, if you play just the first bit, you get no response. If you play just the second bit, you get no response. If you play the whole thing backwards, you get no response. And so what this is saying is that there exists this neuron in the brain that is happy only when it sees this particular combination of two fairly complex acoustic stimuli that happen to be in its vocalic communication uh, system. Um, and so uh, the sort of idea here then again is that there's these neural mechanisms, and, and sorry to sort of wave my hands about biology, um, but there are these neural mechanisms that seem to be giving sparse output when complex things happen in the stimuli, and that somehow the timing of these things and other theories, the timing, relative timing of these events are also somehow meaningful for interpreting what's being said. So, all of this leads to uh, our, our contribution and our model for recognition. Um, and this is work sort of very much inspired by work that Yali did with Partha and Alexei uh, Vladenko um, uh, on trying to use sort of visual uh, uh, computer vision techniques for objects detecting acoustic objects in speech where the objects are words and syllables and so forth. Um, but the idea ultimately is that you're going to transform the signal Instead, into a sort of, instead of into a vector time series representation, into a sparse temporal pa point pattern of acoustic events. And so the, the, thing, the sort of key distinction here is that the random variables are now times. Right? So your observations are points in time. Um, then given that representation, you're going to build models of whole words or syllables or other units um, according to the temporal statistics of these event patterns. Okay? And so that's sort of the basic idea. So the architecture for this is that you're going to take your speech in as input. You're going to have this sort of collection of detectors that are each detecting, trained to detect various things of interest. Um, and each are producing these sort of event patterns in time, one for each detector. And then you sort of collect all of these into the representation that you're going to model. And then you're going to try to detect, say, when a word occurs or a syllable occurs. Uh, and it's going to produce some score. So the first bit of this is to figure out what your feature detectors are going to be. So we considered lots of different things, phonemes, distinctive features, and sort of Ken Stevens style, using HMM states to actually define detectors. Um, so you can do nice clean experiments with respect to HMMs. Um, and then also things like spectrotemporal receptive fields, um, sort of modeled as 2D uh, Gabor filters um, applied to the spectrogram in much the same way that some of the work um, that uh, Tommy Paggio has done with some of his students. Um, but you can imagine that you're going to define these detector sets in all different ways. Um, and at the end of the day, each detector is going to give you an event when it hits a local maxima above a threshold. So that is, if the detector is very confident that something's happening there, all you're going to care about is the point in time in which it was most confident. You're not going to care at all about what was happening around that. You just need to know at that time, that detector is convinced that phone was being spoken, that that distinctive feature was onset or offset, or that HMM state was occurring, and so forth. So we had a, uh, many sort of examples of trying different detector sets, and the sort of simplest one are phonetic detectors, right? So this is the HMM lattice that's going to be used in your sort of canonical speech recognition technology, where you have your phone set on the y-axis, and at each point in time, um, for each phone, you have the likelihood that that, uh, the likelihood of the observation given that phone was present at that point, that phone was being produced at that point in time. And so the HMM applied to this is going, where you're going to decode this ultimately with a Viterbi decode, and that amounts to trying to find the most likely path through this matrix from left 
to write. So that's standard speech recognition. Now, we can go ahead and compute what's called a phonetic posterior gram, which is the posterior probability as a function of time across this phone set. Okay, so it's essentially just normalizing each one of these columns to one. And we're going to define our events as the point in times at which that posterior gram is hitting a local maxima above a posterior probability threshold of a half. And that's going to give you this set of uh, it's this set of phonetic events in time. And so this is the standard HMM representation, the Turby decode. This is going to be our representation. And you see that you're going from 60 or 6,000, over 6,000 real valued times in this representation, and now we're down, or real valued likelihoods, and now we're down to just 57 real valued times in our representation. So, so it's a, Eric, you don't care about transition probabilities, you're just doing it at each frame, um, finding a maximum posterior. Yeah, right. yeah. No, no, no transition probabilities at all. Yeah, there, there's no. Yeah, there's there's no markup. Although, in in one of our papers, in fact, the speech communication paper, I did build a HMM on this, treating it as a binary valued vector time series. Doesn't work as well. Okay. Anyway, so I right, I get there. Okay. And so what we think is ultimately going on here, or one way to view this at least, is sort of geometrically or part that I usually like to do, is that you have a trajectory in time. Um, um, of your speech signal, right? So that vector time series corresponds to a trajectory, and it's sampled uniformly in time. But that's not going to give you uniform sampling in space, right? It's just uniform sampling. And the HMM is ultimately modeling each point along this trajectory. Okay? What we're doing instead is saying we're going to care only about the points in time in which this trajectory comes closest to the categorical center. Right, so at this particular point in time, it came as close as it was going to come to the category phoneme 1, and so we're going to make that an event labeled the phoneme 1, then make the phoneme 2, the phoneme 3, and so forth. And so it's sort of a very different way of characterizing this you know, signal uh, or trajectory um, in terms of just these sort of relevant portions as opposed to this um, uniformly in time sample. And really quickly, a couple other detector sets that we worked with. Um, this was in, uh, used in building a digit recognizer um, for noise robustness experiments, a very standard evaluation for that. And so typically, they model words with whole word HMMs with some number of states, I think it's 16 per word. So what we said is each one of those HMM states has an underlying, underlying Gaussian mixture model um, uh, uh, density. Um, and so we're going to use all of those Gaussian mixture models as separate detectors, right? And uh, we're going to take, again, the local maxima of their posterior probability as a function of time as the uh, event times. And so you go from this thing, which in this case now has 26,000 real value times, and you go to this, which is, or sorry, real value likelihoods, and you drop down to 69 real value times. So it's a massive reduction in uh, the, the sort of detail of the river. And then the final thing, which might be interesting to the vision people in the room, is that we, uh, and this is sort of the most recent thing we took, um, we considered a detector set where we had uh, these two gigamore filters um, centered at different a range of frequencies. Um, and each one of them produces a time series, a sort of response, or the output of that filter um, as a function of time. And we defined events as the points, the local maxima above some threshold of each of those detectors, and you get this sort of very incomprehensible Okay, so now that we have these sort of phonetic events, the next thing is we need a way to sort of model those events um, to predict the presence of words or syllables or something like that. So here we consider uh, word detectors, and the idea is that we're going to slide a window along in time, um, and at each point in time we're going to ask whether or not uh, that pattern of events we see in that window is consistent with our expectation when the word is, the word is occurring in that window. We're going to do this, and I don't, I don't want to get into too much of the details because I think I'm running out of time, but uh, it's ultimately going to be a log likelihood ratio um, detector function, um, and it's going to involve a word model um, uh, for points in time we want to see whether the word occurred and a background model, and we're going to have this sort of latent duration built in that we're going to integrate over um, with an explicit modeling of the duration of a given word uh, across all of the instances we have.
So for the word models, um, we can we, we assume that every event pattern that we see for every detector is produced by some underlying uh, memoryless point process, an uh, inhomogeneous Poisson process, which has a rate parameter which is uh, non-constant time, that changes over time. So you'd expect that you know. In the word uh, tomato, there's two points in time, roughly, that you'd expect the T funny to occur, but not other ones. So you'd expect a high rate parameter in the sort of beginning, and about two thirds of the way through the word. Ultimately, we just to work this out. Um, and so to give you an example what this looks like, here we have our rate parameters as a function of the duration, the fraction of the word that we've gone through, um, for each of our phone detectors. And you see that initially you get um, a high rate parameter for the G detector. Oh, by the way, this is a model for the word greasy. So initially you have a high rate parameter for the G detector followed by the R detector, the E, the S, and the E, and so forth. But you notice there's all these other high rate parameters, and this is encoding all of the confusions that are present for a given word. That is, when the G detector fires, you're also going to likely see every once in a while the K detector fire, because those are very similar sounds. And this model just measures that explicitly. Also, if you have multiple pronunciations of a word, this model is also going to characterize all those multiple pronunciations of the word such that you can detect the word even when it's pronounced in a way that's not its canonical pronunciation, not the pronunciation of the Asian that would be assuming it's pronounced. Uh, this is what the model for seven looks like using those HMM detectors, and you see you get this sort of nice progression through the HMM stage with some confusion in the beginning with six some confusion in the end with one because they have similar speech sounds. And this is kind of a cool picture. This is the model of the word greasy using those um, spectrotemporal modulation detectors. And you get this very sort of strange pattern, which again, I can't really uh, sort of explain to you very well, but there is clearly structure in what these modulation filters are actually doing, enough such that you see uh, an array of filters that detect the occurrence of the For background, we assume we just have a uh, memory, uh, we have a homogeneous Poisson process, which is just measuring the background rate of all of these detectors as a function of time. And so here I come to um, probably, I think, what of late is probably the most important result of this work. And so you can ask, what's the computational efficiency of all of this, right? That is, we have, um, uh, you know, the Turby decode, which is going to be linear in the number of frames that you have in the number of states. And now we have this representation which is extremely sparse in some cases, right, with respect to this. And so now the question is, is how fast can you actually apply these word models? Um, how long does it take to actually evaluate this detector from the time? Um, and uh, in sort of, as of about a week ago, uh, the answer was, um, you can do it, well, so I would say as of about six months ago, these detectors would run in their original formulation a thousand times faster than real That is, if you had a thousand, hour, thousand hours of speech, you can search for um, occurrences of your given word that you're searching for a thousand times in, in one hour, right? So you can do a thousand in one. Um, a couple months ago, a student that's now working on this came to me and said, ah, I came up with this clever pruning mechanism and I got it up to 50,000 times faster in real time. Okay. As of about two days ago, um, when, uh, so this is Ken Church, I don't know how many of you know Ken Church, but he's a very smart guy. And he had this sort of clever insight where he said, ah, oh, we can rearrange this ca calculation in a certain way and do some simple integer computing to speed this whole thing up using a, an upper bound. And he got it up to 75 million times faster than real time. And so the trick here is that instead of our decode being linear in the number of uh, frames and events, it's now just linear in the number of events. So we have this extremely simple machine where these events are coming in every once in a while. And that machine is able to sort of keep track of when it thinks words might have occurred in a very sparse way, and uh, ultimately it's extremely best to compute. So I think one way to view this number is that we can search for one word 75 million times faster in real time. Another way to look for it is that in real time we can search for 75 million words, right? So now we have a way to decode a large vocabulary. You say, ah, but there aren't, in fact, 75 million words in the language. And I said, well, why do we need to stop at words, right? We can now support ngram detectors, right, and do phrase-based speech recognition. And I think it's all made possible by dropping to a representation which is much less sparse, um, but equally uh, capable of giving you a reasonable decode of word. Pretty significant. Yeah. And if you do 
book is new to speech, which is understanding how to apply machine learning techniques to words. Right? So all of the machine learning and speech tends to show up at the frame level. And so what I'm proposing here is that you can apply machine learning to the word level where every uh, example that you're trying to classify into different word categories corresponds to some chunk of speech which can be different things for different um, uh, different realizations of the given word. Uh, and so ultimately now we have intervals of speech which, can, which contain some pattern of events and we want to see if we can tell the difference between say the word the and them in terms of the events that they can contain. And using examples of the and them, we can train discriminatively models of, that sitting on top of these events that can tell the difference and contain any dependencies in the model that the discriminative training finds out work well. So here really quick are some examples of the word the um, from speech and these are the event patterns that you see. There's some number of points, um, certain things in time for each uh, phoneme class. So the positive examples are above. And these are all the things that the baseline large vocabulary system that we're using confuse with the. Right? And so what you see in all of these things, you see a lot of similarity between the positive and negative examples. You see all this sort of noise in these examples that's not there at all. And so this very sparse representation, in this case, you have a word with two phonemes. So you'd expect, ideally, you'd have only two events. Right? There's not a lot of information there about the times that those events occur. You see that there's clearly structure here that you hope to build a reasonable password. And so uh, this is sort of result. So this is on a hundred word text of these discriminative, discriminatively trained models for 100 words. So each dot corresponds to the word to a word. On the x-axis, we have um, uh, the equal error rate using the scores produced by the large vocabulary uh, recognizer built in population maps. On the y-axis, we have our model's equal error rate for each one of these um, word classifiers. And you see, in some cases, we're better, in some cases, they're better. But what I want to point out is this is IBM's current best, honest to goodness, best recognizer that's ever been invented. And it's using everything. Uh, so this is um, LPA, um, um, linear discriminant analysis, uh, mobile track rank normalization, uh, speaker adaptation, um, and discriminative training and print models. So this is sort of that initial slide I had where you had all of the bells and whistles. This is the very best system that the community has produced. This we're getting with this whole word discriminative point process model sitting on top of a neural net classifier. Right? And we're getting comparable uh, word model scores. If you combine these scores together, and I know that's a dirty word to some people, but if you combine these scores, uh, you actually do better in all accounts. So what that's saying is that we've developed something which is so completely orthogonal to uh, what uh, uh, has been done in the past that is complementary, that the scores we're producing are helping. Uh, we have different patterns of error. Okay, uh, so to, to summarize, uh, these sparse event patterns of all different types of ways of defining these events are sufficient to recognize speech. That is, you can recognize speech, making no claims yet on how good it is and so forth. I mean, there is enough signal there to tell the difference between words and so forth. Um, we found that dropping down to this very sparse representation um, uh, provides some just inherent robustness to, to noise. So noise is coming in and corrupting the signal in sort of non-stationary way. Um, modeling just the points in time that really matter, actually, it's actually a good strategy to sort of withstand that noise. And then finally, training uh, these things uh, discriminatively have allowed us to match the performance of uh, state of the